Kroom. Punk Clash! Hello, my Nakamotachi. This is Joy Girl here to talk about the most recent chapter, and oh boy, is this controversial. The title of chapter 1030 is echoing the impermanence of all things, and I think most of us would be inclined to agree with Farmer Frank's comment on our reaction stream that the title might be a tongue in cheek joke about the way that deaths are handled in One Piece. But in the chapter, we were given a lot of updates and we're given a peek at some new awakenings, so make sure to stick around until the end of the video for a full discussion. And if you enjoy our chapter discussions and would like to hear more, please hit that subscribe button. But before we get into the chapter itself, let's first congratulate the winners of this week's Discord artwork competition where the challenge was to draw Kid and Killer's backstory to their relationship. In third place we have Irvin who has depicted a romance of sorts between the two partners and if you ask me I think they're just deeply admiring each other's hairstyles. In second place we have Jiatsuki's short comic and I just love how wholesome this is. The shared dream, promise and the fist bump as the two boys walk off into the sunset really has me feeling some sort of way. And before we announce first place let's give an honorable mention to Sir Rusk who unfortunately didn't finish in time, so he's to hoping we can see the completed artwork soon because this seems to be another very promising comic. But moving on to first place, we have Pukiaki, our reigning champion. Pukiaki's first digital artwork submission is everything the Joy Fleet has come to love about his artworks. The comedy, the bright colours and the story it tells. Bravo Puki! Bravo. A huge congratulations to all of our winners and as always a big thank you to everyone for participating. Now let's get on to the review. This chapter gave us updates on multiple fronts starting with a scene with Drake and Apu as the latter is seen urging Drake to form an alliance and stating that they should take advantage of the fact that once each side has exhausted the other it'll be easier for them to take everyone down. Which is an interesting idea coming from Apu because I think this is the first time I heard Apu talking about claiming the big prize and it makes me more curious as to his character and motivations. Throughout the arc, Apu hadn't ever shown us this ambitious side of him, considering who he's planning to betray, whereas we know why Drake has a reason to beat everyone, the same can't be said for Apu. Whether Apu even has the ability to take over even after everyone is exhausted is another question, but he seemed to be confident having the numbers behind him, which suggests that Apu is confident enough in their abilities. The numbers have intrigued me for the first time in this raid, as the three shown in this chapter seem to be the closest to being fe healing humanoids than what we've seen with previous numbers. These three are interestingly enough seemingly just chilling rather than causing a rampage unlike the other numbers we've seen before. So I'm looking forward to seeing more from these numbers which does come with a little bit of worry attached to it considering how the rest of the numbers have been used in this arc and these three that we've seen in this chapter seems like a good opportunity to do something interesting with them. Like perhaps being the first three numbers to have been experimented on and add that to the theory already floating around that these three are perhaps the numbers created from the three samurais seen in Yamato's flashback in chapter 1024, then the expectation heightens. But whether this theory has any merit to it or not, I think we can all agree that the idea of the numbers being created from regular humans, perhaps those who had opposed Kaido in the past, is an interesting concept and would continue the idea of cruel experiments that we've seen throughout the series, notably in Punk Hazard where the process of artificial gigantification was first introduced, and of course the smile experimentation introduced in the same arc and was delved deeper into at Wano. Kinemon, Kiku, and Kanjuro being alive? Eh, there's no surprises there because as you guys know, when it comes to death in the series, I've always been on the pelt until proven train. We've seen this happen in the series over and over, and expecting otherwise is setting yourself up for disappointment. But that's not to say that criticism on how deaths are handled is not valid. No, in fact, it's natural to feel that way about a series that you love and have high standards for, and as an audience, you may expect the series to mature with you, but then again, just because we feel that way doesn't mean that the author himself has to adjust to us. And I explore this matter of death and how Oda seems to actually feel on this matter more deeply in this discussion, so I highly recommend you check that discussion out. And as for the reveal that these characters are alive, I personally didn't mind it considering my stance, as I've always been pushing the idea that the scabbards will need to be present at the party at the end of Wano and witness Wano's borders opening, the very thing that they're fighting for, firsthand with their own 
eyes, and I firmly still hold the belief that this will happen. I do, however, have a slight issue with how Kinemon was revealed to have survived. The first time I read the chapter, I gotta admit this is something that I didn't delve into too much with my thoughts, but upon rereading the chapter, I realized that I may not be a fan of this idea. Look, as much as I love the goofiness in One Piece, I think conveniently using something we've seen in the past, which was shown as a plot device to move to connect the plot and was used as a comedy, to now resolve something as serious as a major side character's death, especially after showing that death in such a dramatic fashion, only for it to be resolved this way. As a reader who loves the series, I can't help but feel meh, a certain way about it, or rather an uncertain way. Especially when it comes to something like fake out deaths, which is something that fans have already been voicing their distasteful for quite some time. So whilst I'm not in the same boat as those who dislike the chapter because of the reveal of the three fake out deaths, I do understand it on some level because of how I now feel about the segment with Kinemon. Also, that explanation brought up some questions such as, wouldn't Kinemon have felt anything unusual about his body if it wasn't reattached completely? Considering the nature of foreshadowing in One Piece, you would think that this is something that we would have seen planted somewhere earlier. So having this explanation kind of makes it feel like either a last minute decision or a whatever idea. It doesn't have the feeling of it being planned out, or at least not planned out thoroughly or smoothly. The other question is, how capable is Law actually as a surgeon if he can't properly reattach the bodies he's severed? Because I've usually thought of Law's ability to be an instant cut and paste, with the pasting just involving bodies returning to their original form, but now it's been confirmed that reattaching body parts requires more input from Law, and that hasn't been completed in the case with Kinemon, and so then that doesn't really reflect well on Law's ability as a surgeon, does it? I mean, I'd always thought of Law as someone who leaves no room for error. That is of course going on the assumption that Law fixed Kinemon himself, which is the assumption I always had, but since we had only seen the Straw Hats put him back together, then this could be the explanation used for Kinemon not being put back together correctly. But I don't think this necessarily makes it better, because the first question of how Kinemon never noticed this non-alignment of his body still applies. It does make it entertaining if you embrace the goofiness of the idea, because of the Straw Hats' inability in piecing Kinemon back together, somehow saved his life. Huh, sort of like Kid's missing arm in the last chapter. And with things like this, it's hard not to keep diving in with questions, because at the end of the day, we just want to make sense out of it. But again, I love the goofiness in general, but with a development as serious as this, unless Oda surprises me with further explanation, this just doesn't feel as well thought out, or doesn't feel like it's quite justified. But at the end of the day, this is just a personal opinion, and it doesn't take away from how good the series has been, especially the current arc. So to summarize, I do like that the characters are alive, but how the explanation of how Kinemon survived makes me feel a little iffy. That being said, we could just pin this to Kinemon's incredible luck. As for Kanjuro's final act, I'm excited to see where this leads to as we get another obstacle for the allies to overcome and perhaps will give some of those who haven't had much highlights in the raid to help showcase more of their abilities. If I had to put money on this, my bet is on Usopp, who was seen in this chapter following Kinemon's request to save Kiku and Kinemon's other half, and we're talking literal other half, not Suru over here. And Usopp may run into the Kazenbo on the way, or Yamato who was on the way to defuse the bombs and will perhaps be tested against the Kazembo as a hindrance to their objectives. Apart from plot development, I like this segment between Orochi and Kanjuro quite a lot. It really made the chapter feel like as a part of a play. Orochi's foreboding words of doom was audible and really raised the tension to make me get ready to watch things unfold. We also got plenty of mini updates in this chapter, with my favorite being these panel shots of the monster trio fighting their respective opponents, but the one that really piqued my interest is seeing the update on CP0, now out and about, and seem to be heading somewhere. In the panel before this, we see Robin and Brooke, and considering CP0's objective of capturing Nico Robin, it seems that these two groups will collide sooner than later. Getting to the main event, now we have the Kid and Law vs Big Mom fight, which seems to be taking the main focus now, which I find surprising because I thought this fight would finish up after Zoro and Sanji's matchups, and will be the final fight to be resolved just before Luffy's fight against Kaido, considering that Big Mom herself is a Yonko, like Kaido, so it's natural to think that the fights will be shown in that order. And that could still of course happen, because it's not like we saw this fight end yet, but what we did see are some interesting abilities from both Law and Kid. I know that there are some complaints about this segment too, with some feeling that the pacing to the lead up to this was off, or that these awakenings came out of nowhere with seemingly no prior build up. Personally, I'm again not on that boat, and I'm gonna hold out until we see
see more of this develop before expressing my thoughts on how I feel about how this has been handled. Seeing the awakenings here does obviously bring up questions for the future as well, and whether this means we'll also see Luffy's awakening in the arc, but for now, I'm just going to enjoy how cool these awakenings were. I thought what we saw with Kit and Law in this chapter was quite fun. I really liked the team up aspect of it and found it hilarious when Law told Kid not to tell him what to do as he was about to do exactly just that, which is a hilarious reminder of Law's interaction with his fellow supernovas back on the rooftop, so I like seeing the consistency of Law's Sundera vibe. Also for the awakenings themselves, I found them super cool. I thought Law's crew was really interesting and it seems to have had a good enough effect on Big Mum to make her look vulnerable without even playing into her emotions. It's quite strange to see Big Mum in this predicament and the way it bothers her, considering how much of a powerhouse she's been portrayed to be, and it really feels like they're getting closer and closer to figuring out how to take the Yonko down. Of course, I'm confidently stating yet again that Kid will show out, but I do want further explanation on Kid's cool ability. It seems to have been activated from a closer distance, as seen with Law having to teleport Kid away from the incoming pile of metals hurtling towards Big Mom. I've always liked magnetic powers, and it'd be interesting to get an explanation on how the magnetism works in this case, such as whether it's the manipulation of iron in an individual's blood. It was also stated that the stamina consumption of using their awakened abilities is extreme and ensures that they'll lose the battle, so it'll be interesting to see what's next in the development of this battle because I'm sure this fight is not yet over and we will see more from Big Mom herself and I highly anticipate the same for our worst generation members. Overall, I think this is another good chapter. It might be remembered for a different reason considering the amount of consistently great chapters we've been getting, but I really appreciate all the updates, especially for characters we haven't seen in a while. And even if there's that little bit that I don't quite like, I don't think it negates how good Wano has consistently been in my opinion, and I'm sure we will get more epic chapters to come. But now that you've heard my thoughts, let me know yours by leaving a comment below. Please don't forget to hit that like, share, and subscribe button for more One Piece discussions, and you can also join our Joyfully Discord server for more One Piece related fun. You can even become a patron member to get certain roles and powers within that server, and thank you to our patrons for help supporting the channel. This is Joy Girl, and I'll see you again soon.